Good morning, bon dia, wam kele kile, en welkom, SUC family. We're so excited to join with you in our service this week. We love you, we miss you, and we are praying for you. May this service be a blessing to you, and above all, to our Heavenly Father. Morning everybody, welcome to the Summer Strain United Church service this morning online. I hope you're all doing well, and I'm sure it's not going to be much longer now we're going to see each other again. I'm going to take a reading this morning from Psalm 63, verse 7 to 8. I think how much you have helped me. I sing for joy in the shadow of your protecting wings. I follow close behind you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, when we look back and reflect on our life journey, that's when we realize you are always there. Often when we deep in troubled water, we don't realize it was you, Lord, that rescued us. We pay, pray for complete peace and no anxiety as we listen to your word and sing your praises. Amen. Bless the Lord. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun.
Welcome to another service here at SEC. We're so glad that you have joined us. Before I get going with my sermon, a little bit of family news. While the Swans have got their grandparents up from my side, my mom and dad have come to visit here in PE and they are loving their, their time with Benji and Benji is loving his time uh, seeing his grandparents. The last time they got to see him was a long time ago. And so it's just been wonderful to spend a little bit of family time together, get to show them our wonderful bay, get to go for some walks down on the beachfront, and also to go for a few swims in our warmer water than Cape Town. Well, for our sermon today, we're continuing on in the journey of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is still going for it with his disciples. He's still teaching away. Uh, we have gone through chapter 5 and we are about to finish chapter 6. And as we're going to be seeing a little bit later on, remember when Jesus was doing this, when Jesus was teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, he didn't do this section and then a week later do another section and then a week later do another section and then a week later do another section. This is all a continuous teaching in one moment. So now I've sat in some lectures where I'm like, oh my word, this is some heavy stuff. Imagine sitting through the Sermon on the Mount from beginning to end. This last, we've been going through this now for about three or four months. Imagine all that content going in one time. It's pretty amazing. Well, let's open up our time with a little question. What, what will bring your heart peace in this life? What will bring your heart peace in this life? Now, let's try and answer this objectively. And um, maybe if you want to press pause and just ask your spouse the, the same question, what, would, what do they think would bring your heart peace in this life? It might be eye-opening. But let's break that answer down. Whatever that might be, let's break that answer down because... At its base level, I think this is where the, the text answers that at the base level, it is either going to be on the genre of money, worldly things, or it is going to be on the genre of God, godly things. And because what brings us peace ultimately is where our eyes look to and where our hope is laid up. And I think that's why Jesus ends the last section with this phrase, you cannot serve God and money, which Murray got into last week, and then he goes into this, the next section that we're going to be reading with this word, therefore. Because when you read the word, therefore, you have to ask the question, wherefore? And so Jesus goes from this, you cannot serve God and money, because at the essence of what we seek is either one of those two things. And so therefore, he goes into the text, and Jesus just carries on this, this part. And so let's kick us off with Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. So if you don't have your Bibles already, press pause, go get your Bibles, switch on your phone, or switch on your phone, put flight mode on, have your app there, um, so you don't get carried away. But let's read Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34, and then we're going to pray. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spoil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this wonderful week that we've been able to enjoy, whether it has had ups, whether it has downs, whether we have had worries and anxieties about life, future, South Africa, lockdown, corona, 
kids, college. Lord, there are lots of worries in this world that catch us up. But Lord Jesus, I pray that you help us to listen to your teaching here. This teaching was given 2,000 years ago and it is just as effective today. It is just as alive as it was 2,000 years ago today and it will be for the rest of our lives. Help us to listen, help us to be courageous, help us to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts. Amen. Well, let's just go through the text. I always enjoy just walking through the text and, and letting the text dictate where where we go. And so let us just go through. So that therefore, we, we've, we've covered a little bit in the introduction. We, it's the, you cannot serve God on money. Therefore, I tell you, this is Jesus laying down his authority, going through the Sermon on the Mount, as we went through, particularly the, you have heard, going through the law. Then he says, I tell you, this is Jesus laying down his authority again. Remember, Jesus is not just a man, but he's the God of the universe. He is the one who has all authority over everything. So this person, this Jesus, this God-man who has all authority tells us, Do not be anxious about your life, what you eat or what you drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. So this word anxiety, do not be anxious about your life. Well, let's look at this word anxiety and let's try and make a little bit of a definition of it. If we looked at the academic definition of anxiety, it is feeling a unrest. It is feeling strong emotion about an unknown event or an unknown reality in our lives. And it is quite a catchphrase, I think, in, in our society. Anxiety is a major, uh, not necessarily a catchphrase, but anxiety is a major talking topic and a major reality in this life. And then we have this extreme and theological position that a lot of theologians hold and and some Christians hold even that anxiety is what they call atheistic uh, what was it an atheistic untrust of God they, they they go along the lines of well if you're anxious well then you are not trusting in God enough and therefore in that reality God does not exist and I, I think both of those um, you you can you can look through, but I, I think I'm going to try and maybe find some middle ground between those two. And I, I think my proposed balanced proposal is anxiety is something that is a natural response to this world. I was listening to a, a podcast a few weeks ago by a, a Christian psychologist posted on the Gospel Coalition, and he did this awesome job of walking us through the Gospels and through events of Jesus' life, and just and just changing Jesus' name to Bob. I don't know why he changed it to Bob, but just I think he just wanted to get us out of the mindset of this is Jesus, and just change his name. And he asked us on all these occasions, what do you think the emotion is that Jesus could be feeling at this point? And it was amazing to see, hey, Jesus also struggled with anxiety. When we look at the sermon, uh, when we look at the, the, the prayer at Gethsemane, the night before he's arrested, when he is praying and he is sweating blood, it is natural to think one of the emotions that he could be feeling is anxiety. And so I think anxiety is a natural response in our bodies to this fallen and unknown world that we find ourselves in. But then there is the anxiety disorder. So we're going to be primarily dealing with the anxiety of just anxiety over day to day that uh, is not defined within the anxiety disorder. And we're going to get through some practicalities of how to deal with anxiety at the end. And, and we're going to be dealing briefly with anxiety disorder. But how do, we, how do we recognize anxiety? Well, there are a couple of ways that we can recognize anxiety. There is avoidance. I, I've got this little list here, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read it. There's overthinking, there's avoidance, there's sweating, there's stomach issues, there's panic attacks, there's needing assurance, there's lack of patience, there's trouble concentrating, there's procrastination, there's constant worrying, there's trouble breathing, there's headaches, rapid heartbeat, insomnia, and memory issues. There there are a lot of life realities that are connected with anxiety and the, and the health of our minds. And so Jesus says, do not be anxious. Do not have this uh, worry about the future, about what this 
evil world is all about, but rather trust in God. And so he says, do not be anxious about your life. And then he goes and he, he, he deals with uh, how we are to, uh, as, as I guess, sources of not being anxious. The first one is, what are we anxious about? What are we anxious about? And there are three things. They are the bodies, they are food, and they are clothes. Now, I think if we had to uh, sit and try and dissolve down our anxieties of day-to-day -day anxieties, I think that this nails it on the, on the spot. Bodies, food, and clothes. And the primary reason given in the text to counter anxiety of this kind of nature, this day-to-day -day worry and fear of the future, is, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now, let's look at a, a proof to how this is, this is true. Now, let's consider the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, where Jesus, God-man, comes down and he lives his life for us, as we're reading now, he's teaching us, and then he dies for us, he resurrects, and his Holy Spirit then when we give our lives to Jesus, when he saves us, indwells us, and he has saved us from the wrath of God. Now, if we take that good news, while we are still enemies of Christ, that Christ died for us, if our problem was just this world, well, why didn't God just send us some extra cash? Think about it. Why did God's rescue plan bring Jesus, his son, to die for us? so that we can have an eternal life with God, laying up treasures in heaven. This life is more than clothes, food, and our bodies. Now the text, as we're going to be getting into later, is not saying that we shouldn't worry about or be good stewards of our bodies, and good stewards of our food, and good stewards of our clothes, and our financial realities in our lives, but we should have a different mindset than this world, that this life is something greater, something more than those three elements. And we should be laying our trust in something far greater than those three elements. And so then Jesus moves on. He goes and he proves this, this point that life is more than food, body and clothing by looking at nature. Now, Nature has this wonderful ability to show us more about God and consequently more about ourselves. Well, let's have a look at this text. The first one is, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And that's true. When we look at birds, they are always going. They are always feeding, but they never gather up. And are you not more valuable than they? This is a rhetorical question. If, you, if we go back and we go read Genesis and we read through the account of how God created the universe, the pinnacle of creation is you and I. The pinnacle of creation is Adam and Eve, humanity. And are you not more valuable than they? God comes in human form. There are so many, uh, there are so many proofs in the Bible that we are the pinnacle of creation in this world. And we are more valuable than the birds of the field. And which of you, now hear this, anxious people, including myself, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? What a simple truth. As we look at the birds, as we look at nature going on around us, anxiety doesn't help them. In the same way, anxiety doesn't help us. If we are feeling anxious, if we are feeling worried about the future, it doesn't bring any extra comfort or lifespan to our lives. In fact, it brings wrinkles and gray hair and balding. All those kind of things that, that I'm slowly but surely struggling with. And then he goes on, and why are you anxious about clothing? So he goes on to clothing. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, they just they come up. And yet I tell you, even Solomon and all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will 
he not much more clothe you? Again, this is the argument of little to great. If we look at the fields where God gives life and rain and nurturing to the world, well, how much more will God give it to us, the ones he loves, the ones he saves, and the ones he made as the pinnacle of creation? And then he has this simple phrase that he often that Jesus often says to his disciples, Oh, you of little faith. I don't think this is Jesus uh, in youth ministry. We have this little phrase, opening a can. I don't think this is Jesus uh, slapping his disciples around the ear saying, Oh man, you guys are just idiots. You guys just don't have any faith. I think this is a, a loving statement. Jesus wants his disciples to realize they are awesome. They, they are the pinnacle of creation. They are people loved and cared for by God. And how can we, if we are living like that, if we know that, how can we be worrying about our bodies and our possessions and our food? And then Jesus, coming out of this proclamation, he uh, the, the guiding principle um, that we will soon see is that God gives, if we give God the place in our lives that he is due, then we will know his care for us which is a crucial tool in shaking off anxiety and depression in this life. And so also in, in nature telling us about God, we can, we can think about some other places in scripture that tell us the same truth. In Romans chapter 1 verse 20, Paul tells the, the Romans that God's invisible attributes, namely his divine power and Divine, uh, eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived. And, and if we go back to the Psalm of David in Psalm 19, a wonderful psalm of how the heavens declare the glory of God. And you can picture David out on those starry nights or just out on the, the open expanse fields of Jerusalem and the Middle East and just going, oh my word, God is the God of the heavens. Go read Psalm 19 and pick up those, those themes. And so God is a powerful God. God is a caring God. And God is someone who is there and is wanting to help us, who has the desire to help us and has the ability to help us and helps us. And then Jesus goes on to the second phrase of do not be anxious. We are in verse 31. Therefore... Do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? So Jesus goes on to the second statement, and Jesus is processing, our, uh, processing us to help us to define our ambitions by asking, what do we worry about? Now, the historians say, historians say that most of the people around the time of Jesus, they had little beyond basic necessities. And Jesus and even, even Jesus himself knew what it was like to be lacking in flu, food and, and clothing and shelter. And so Jesus knows and his disciples know and we know that this anxiety in our lives is real. The question is, does it keep our gaze or are we able to turn our gaze from our anxiety, acknowledge it, and turn our gaze to God, and turn our eyes to Jesus. Because Jesus gives these stimulating responses for such obedient living. In the world, we should stand out in sharp contrast to the Gentiles. Now, let's look at verse 32. For the Gentiles seek after these things. Now, Let's try and understand or remind ourselves who the Gentiles are. The Gentiles, back in, the, back in Jesus' day, they were Jews and they were Gentiles. The Jews were considered God's people, God's people who loved God, who served God, who were obedient to God. Now, we know that isn't always the case. But the Gentiles were those outside of God's community, those who did not look anything like God's community. And God's community shouldn't have looked anything like the ungodly community. So let's try and think of a 21st century term for Gentiles, that if, if this was said today, I, I think would be 
for the unbelievers, those who do not love Jesus, those who do not seek his obedience, those who do not seek God's kingdom, seek after these things. And these things being clothes, body, and shelter. Now it is not a bad thing to want clothes, it is not a bad thing to want food, it is not a bad thing to want shelter for your family. But this text is going down beyond that periphery and going down to the core. What is at our core desire of our lives? Is it this world or is it God? That is what the meta-narrative of the Sermon on the Mount is all about at the moment. What is our core value? Do we value God more or do we value this world more? And the second uh, stimulating reason of such obedient living of not being anxious in this life in this in this verse 40 in this verse 32 is and your heavenly father knows that you need them all so god is an all powerful god he is a transcendent god he is a god that is above our understanding above our thoughts above our imagery but he is a personal God. He is a Abba. He is a Father. He is someone of love and unity and peace. And he is here and he knows what we need. And sometimes what we need is also what we want. Sometimes. But this is very interesting. God knows what we need. God doesn't give us what we want all the time. God doesn't give us what we want in our timing that we want. God knows what we need. Now, parents, and I'm slowly, surely, but learning this, we know what our kids need, and they know what they want. And sometimes those don't align, and sometimes those do, and it is the same with us and our Father God. And so keep these, these, this in mind, all these things, as we'll come into the, the next verse. And this is verse 33, one of, I think, the, one of the famous verses of the Sermon on the Mount. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And so what shall we do then? What is the big thing that we should do to help us have the toolkit to fight against anxiety and depression in this life? Well, what we should do is but seek first the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is saying, this is a struggle, but seek. This is not something that comes naturally to us. This is not something that we naturally desire. What we naturally desire is trying to keep on to this world. We want to keep on to our clothes and shelter and, and food. It is not something that comes naturally to us to seek first the kingdom of God. And the seeking is not a metaphorical seeking. It is not a spiritualized seeking. It is an actual seeking. The kingdom of God is real. And we can... We can have the kingdom of God in our lives. Jesus started his ministry. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. The kingdom of God is here today. It is not fully here today. We do not have the full blessing of the kingdom of God here today. That is our future hope. That is our glory. That is what we long for and hope for. But the kingdom of God is something that can be found and something that can be lived in and something that can be desired and and grow in as we believe in Jesus and walk with him. But seek first the kingdom of God. And so we should be putting God first. We should be desiring to seek God in this life rather than clothes and shelter and food. We shouldn't want to put money first. We should be wanting to put God first. And if we put God in his rightful place then this blessing will come and all these things will be added to you. Now again, this is not along the lines of the prosperity gospel because this is not, and all those things that you want, all that long list of what will make you happy in this life will be added to you. No, it doesn't say that. What it says is all these things will be added to you. All these things of food and clothing and shelter, which in fact all comes from God, all these God-given gifts for our lives, which he knows best on how to give them and how for us to use them, will be given to us. We will be given a life of peace, even in the 
even in the reality possibly of struggle. Because what we have been given is perfectly given to us by a God who knows us and knows what we need. And so if we are struggling with anxiety in our day-to-day reality, the first thing that we should be doing is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And Jesus continues in this last verse, 30, verse 34, and the last and the third do not be anxious phrase. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now this echoes the, the biblical narrative of God's provision. The nation of Israel in the wilderness with manna on how they were to trust God for manna for the next day. And remember the, in the story where they tried to hoard the manna, trying to keep it for the next day while well, it went, st- uh, went gross, it went off before the, the next day. So manna was meant to be this everyday provision and reliance upon God. And I think this is where, where Jesus is going with this verse. Is, Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And it also reflects the prayer that Jesus gives his disciples earlier in the Sermon on the Mount of give us today our daily bread. Now picture the the Lord's Prayer in your mind. I'm sure we all know it, at least semi by by heart. How does it start? It doesn't start with give us today our daily bread. It starts with giving God the right place in our lives, hallowed be your name, giving him worship, giving him honor, giving him glory, giving him our hearts, and then your your will be done. We are surrendering to his authority. And so in the disciples' prayer, in the Lord's prayer, we are to give God his place. We are to put ourselves in the place of the kingdom of God, to say, God, your kingdom reigns, and I submit to your authority And in that framework, give us today our daily bread. Because we know that today is going to be a struggle in this world. We know that tomorrow is going to be a struggle in this world. And just give us today what we need. So it is clear that even under the era of COVID and all that has been going on today, this text still speaks to us of do not be anxious. But seek first the kingdom of God. And so what about today? Well, is my anxiety is my anxiety sin? Is my anxiety something that I can deal with? Can I overcome anxiety? And I, this is not an exhaustive helpful uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but I hope it is a helpful list of five points that we can take home to give us the, the, the toolkit to try and Uh, beat and and defend and overcome anxiety in our day-to-day lives. The first one is know that you are not alone, nor are you the only one dealing with the emotion of anxiety. As we speak to one another, as we open our hearts, as Hebrews says, as we talk to one another, we get peace. We suddenly realize, oh my word, I'm not alone. There are brothers and sisters around me who are having the same struggle. And if we have the definition of anxiety, that it is a common response of our day-to-day lives of this sinful world around us, well then what we are currently experiencing is found in the Bible by prominent people of faith. When we read through the Bible with that kind of mindset, there are prophets, there are servants of God, there are kings, there are Uh, people in the New Testament, there is even, as we said, Jesus himself who battled with anxiety. But all of them managed to bring their gaze beyond themselves to God. And anxiety, if we, uh, I looked at the World Health Organization and looked at their stats for anxiety, and it was quite scary, quite eye-opening their world stats for anxiety from, they, they took the ages of 9 to 15 to 90 to 100. And the stats go pretty much like this. From teenagers to the elderly, we battle with anxiety. There was this little peak around the 40, 50 year olds, but otherwise it was consistent. 
and ladies, I'm sorry to say, the, the WHO, the World Health Organization, said universally, women are in the millions more anxious than men. And so we are not alone when we battle with anxiety, and it is definitely not a sin to feel the emotion of anxiety. And so the big question, and the second one, the big question is where are our eyes looking? The meta-narrative of our current situation in the Gospel of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount is where are our eyes looking? Where are our hearts being laid? Where is our foundation? Where are the roots of our faith? Where are the roots of our life? Are they on God or are they on something else? Because if they are on God, that is a very helpful tool to counter anxiety because we can trust God who loves us, who knows what we need. And we can remind ourselves of the truths of the gospel. When, when these emotions come, when these feelings come, we can go, you know what, I know the truth. God is there. God is a God of love and God provides. The third thing that we can do in, in today in dealing with anxiety is acknowledging our limits. Knowing that we are not the do-all and end-all of everything, that we have limits. And particularly when it comes to knowing the future, cling to the one who does. Now, I love planning. I love to look at the future and go, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. And it was quite a grounder when the first time I came back to the office after lockdown level five, I looked at my little A3 calendar of the year and all the dates. And I realized, oh my word, I did not know what was going to happen this year. You know, I had this picture that this was going to happen and this was going to happen and this was going to happen. And, you know, it was very set. I mean, I even had weekends and dates and, and all these things set out. And suddenly, man, we are limited to know the future. So we need to acknowledge our limitations. The fourth one is... Remember what God has done. And this is, again, the continual narrative of God's people through the Old Testament, through the New Testament. Remember what God has done. This is why we do things like communion. And, and we, we, we take the body of Christ and the blood of Christ and we remember what Christ has done for us. That is why, that is, uh, that is why in the Old Testament they, they did the Day of Atonement, the, the Passover, all those festivals. It was to remember what God has done, because, well, at least for me, I struggle to remember things. And I think that's the narrative of the, of the Israelites in the desert especially. We struggle to remember the providence and love of our God day to day. And this is something that we should be doing, with, that we should be remembering what God has done. And that will bring us great uh, comfort for the future. When we are worrying, I wonder... Gee, but am I going to be able to pay the bills by the end of this month? Well, then think, have I ever not been able to? And allow that to bring hope into the future. And lastly, and this goes along with the anxiety disorder, seek the wisdom of a godly psychiatrist. Now, some Christians do not necessarily agree with me on, on this one. Medication is not evil. In, in, in my opinion, medication can be part of the common grace of God. And so, yes, it is not always the answer, and it should not be the first point of call. But God has given us great medical practitioners in this world and great insights to those people to bring us some uh, levelers. And so if you are struggling with anxiety that is greater than the day-to-day -day anxiety, greater than just the here and now, dealing with an anxiety disorder, well, do these other things. Seek first the kingdom of God. And also, if you're feeling comfortable with it, go and seek a psychiatrist. And so to wrap us up, what will bring your heart peace in this life? Will it be something that is not God? Or will it be something that has everything to do with God. We should be people who are trusting in God in a life full of anxiety. 
And I, I think just to, to really wrap us up, I, I want to read a text from Paul to the Philippians. This is a, a wonderful memory verse. It is Philippians chapter 4. As we, as we are considering this life of do not be anxious about this life. It is more than our clothes, more than our bodies, more than our shelter. It is something that is given to us by God and something that we are not to be anxious about, but hand it over to God. Listen to these words of Paul as we wrap up before we pray. Don't worry about anything. This is Philippians 4 verses 6 to 7. Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are here. You are the great high priest who lived our lives, who knows all the things that we experience. Lord Jesus, you were someone who experienced anxiety in this world today. You know what we are currently experiencing. You are with us. Father God, you know our day-to-day -day lives. You know our day-to-day -day lives far greater than we even do. Help us to trust you. Help us to trust you. That will do us great aid in this world of anxiety. Lord Jesus, that is our simple prayer. Help us to trust you. We pray this in your most holy and glorious name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And I hope that you have a wonderful rest of week. And we'll be seeing you soon. Bye for now. Hey, SUC family. What a privilege it's been to gather around God's word again today. We are so thankful for our very special SUC community. It's been such a blessing to witness the kindness and generosity of our church family. Our faithful commitment to monthly tithing ensures that our ministry, worship and outreach continues. If you need more information, feel free to go to our website www.summerstrandunited.co.za